today's session is titled as money slave or master i'm sure that the title itself brings up a lot of curiosity and this is such an important and relevant topic for all of us to explore we have with us shrinivas mulugu to help us unravel this mystery attached to this topic let me give you a brief introduction about the speaker Shrinivas Mulugu is the vice chairman of Sri Aurobindo Society for Telangana State. He is also a national director for Aura Youth and of Sri Aurobindo Foundation for Integral Management, SAFIM. In his corporate career, Shrinivas worked for 20 years with several globally renowned companies including Nokia Siemens and Cisco Systems. At the age of 44, he took retirement from his active career to pursue his spiritual interests. Shrinivas has been associated with the mother and Sri Aurobindo for 35 years. He is now based in Hyderabad and conducts meditation workshops and spiritual retreats for serious seekers on the path of integral yoga. We are extremely happy to have you with us in this session. In this 15 minute sessions, I request Shrinivas ji to give us an insight on the following questions. How much money is enough? do we control money or does earning money consume our life how does one develop mastery over the over money in life what kind of relationship should i develop with money can money be a channel for spiritual growth with this i request shrinivas ji to take over the session uh, in a minute just give me a minute so that we can go live on facebook thank you harshita let us take up this uh, topic of significant importance most of us we know the role and importance that money plays so we'll spend this evening discussing a little bit and then try to have a lot of time for question and answers also so tell me when to begin harshita we will take it up at that yes, time yes, meanwhile i have just turned on the screen sharing if anyone has difficulty with it um, please let us know on the chat box if you are able to see the title slide that's well and good you can begin now. we are live great so welcome everyone um, glad we are together on a sunday evening much of what we share in these evening sessions of aura youth are topics that are of importance to youth in the age group of 18 to 30 covered with some kind of a spiritual orientation with the idea that we receive guidance practical as well as spiritual in our lives on various topics and today's topic money is something that all of us are spending our lives in some way or the other intertwined with one of the logical questions that comes up is money is it a slave or is it a master or sometimes when you turn it the other way around the question becomes am i a slave or am i a master when it comes to money so we'll try to explore this topic and because we are discussing primarily with the aura youth the target audience being 18 to 30 we will try to take up some flavor of what it, what money is and what career is in this first 10 years of one's life after education and we'll try to tackle various topics related in that direction so some of the things we'll try to discuss what are the symptoms of being a slave to earning money how do we outwit and how do we outwit capitalism in the rat race and how does one develop mastery and command over money so this is what we'll try and do and in fact this is a part of a two session series um the this session is on uh, the the relationship with money and the slave master association that we have <clears throat> so let's take that up so what are the things that money gets us in life and we all know the list we need a house education is important healthcare is important vehicles transport um of course the shopping list is always there 
and eating out vacations essentially the things that almost we need to survive and to some extent to enjoy life these are the things that money gets us and i don't think any of us have any disputes on this this is what are the quote unquote essentials when it comes to money but in the process of earning money what happens for most of us is that our life seems to be consumed with work we have entered a rat race in the process of working we get some income we pay our bills and somewhat a little bit of lifestyle related changes many times no savings and particularly in the last 15 years plastic money the credit cards have become very popular uh, the usage of uh, credit cards has exponentially increased digital money has become a part of our life and in the process what we are doing is also spending sometimes more than what we can afford and taking loans has also become very common 25 years ago loans wasn't a very common phenomenon in india but today loans have become very easy to get for most part of indian uh, demographic and in this process if you look at the time we are spending indian millennials the first generation workforce those who were born between 1995 or 1990 and 20 you know 2005 as many of them are entering the workforce today statistics indicate their average working period is almost 52 hours average 52 hours means the peak is probably 60 hours which some of you are putting in quite often uh somewhere about 7 10% of the time is gone in commute as the cities expand and what is happening is that the rat race of capitalism is producing more wealth but also more working class millennia you know millennials there is the bank balance is high but the rat race doesn't stop now when we look at capitalism which is currently the dominant form of earning a living for most of us in india and most of us in the world to understand the origins of capitalism one of the articles of new york times says that to understand capitalism you should understand plantations what is a plantation plantation is a term that goes back to 19th century america this was where the british colonies were gradually becoming into a federation and gradually eventually they became united states of america where there was land available there were few owners available but there weren't enough workers so there was an entire slave trade that happened from africa to america where slaves were brought in to cultivate these lands in tobacco and uh, cotton and all of this sugarcane in some of the southern uh, islands there and that is where the work ethic of capitalism was born is what some of the people think and what does it mean it means that essentially long and short of it is you produce as a slave you work long hours you get very limited vacation you don't get the luxury of time and on and on and on and somewhere the roots of capitalism go back to that why do we say that the goal or the result of capitalism in the western society and increasingly in other societies also is that the essentials we spoke about to be able to have a house to be able to own a car to be able to educate our children the wages we need to earn consume almost 90% of the wages we earn go into these bare essentials this is what is happening today this is how capitalism is readjusting the prices for example if you go back 200 years ago or 300 years ago it wasn't the case an average farmer worked maybe 4 months in a year 6 months in a year and he had 6 months off if you go back to the traditional indian culture similarly there was a pace of life which was very different but in the process what is happening today is our needs and wants are being restructured in such a way that our purpose of life becomes just existence our eye is on the ball we are constantly juggling all of these things and almost when a person starts the career to the person getting married and the person retiring life goes off in a blip 
trying to just make these essentials meet and the prices of essentials are adjusted to consume most of the income. This is the reality of capitalism. And some of the symptoms, for example, and these are some of the examples directly from my own life. Um, I had a colleague in one of uh, uh, other countries. I, I used to travel to multiple countries uh, where uh, he was giving client presentations while his wife was delivering their first child. And um, he was recognized and honored for his commitment to the company, whereas I was um, sitting there, we were many of us from different countries were together, and I was kind of wondering, um, is this really the essence of life? Is this why we really want to work? That when the family is going through important milestones, we do not, um, we are just not present there. We are not a part of it. Similarly, um, many jobs today, increasingly in this quote unquote globalized world, almost middle management to the top management, the upper third if you take, there are almost no stationary jobs anymore. Every person is on a flight. Every week, people are on a flight. And I've endured some of it. I was lucky that I endured it when I was still very young. I was barely 30 or 32 when I was covering all of Asia Pacific from India, uh, which is quite a Herculean task in itself. But when one begins to do such kind of travel and that goes on into 40s and 50s, and you're working all day in the evening, you don't know what to do. You're sitting with friends somewhere in a hotel or a bar and the kind of meaning of life, the work life balance, the harmony in which one should lead a life. Some of these things come into question as to what is the relevance and how is the relevance and how do we ensure that we don't go into the slavery to earning money. These are symptoms of the slavery. We'll come to other aspects of how does one step back from such overriding situations. Having a heart attack on the day of retirement. I've seen a video of a, a gentleman from a bank uh, who in his retirement speech uh, basically uh, collapsed in some way. Um, and that has more to do with just earning money. That also has a sense of uh, self-worth and self-identity associated to this position or wealth. Somewhere we have to figure out um, how much do we need and actually this is a beautiful quotation from one of the intellectual um, intellect, intellectuals and philosophers from 19th century America called Ralph Waldo Emerson. He says money often costs too much. What he's saying is the price we pay in terms of our life sometimes may exceed the value of what money brings to us. Let us just think about it for a second. When a loved one needs us, if we are not around, when a child needs us, um, when a parent needs us, when we are caught in this intercontinental drift um, with Corona, many people are going through this. Um, Middle-aged children working elsewhere, parents uh, in India, um, all of these things are coming into shorter, you know, sharper focus. And we should be in a good position to understand where we stand and what is the cost. And by the way, this doesn't limit this behavior or this concern or this pattern doesn't limit itself to a quote unquote corporate career um, in a high flying thing. Um, the truth of the matter is I have my own relatives where, uh, you know, they're in smaller towns where one would think life is at an easier pace. Um, but but uh, the truth of the matter is uh, the, the, the journey is the same. I've had somebody who is a, a district educational officer covering rural areas, getting up five in the morning, taking a bus, traveling to rural parts of the country. I've had couples where they stay in one location and each morning one takes a train in one direction, the other in another direction um, because both their jobs are in different, play, different towns and they found a midpoint to stay and they come back at night at eight o'clock. And, and then the life continues. So this is not just a pattern of uh, uh, corporate uh, India in, uh, in uh, you know, glitzy uh, buildings. It's also the, the truth of India in smaller towns increasingly. And we have to figure out somewhere, what is the cost that we have? Similarly, we also have to understand when we talk about capitalism and increasingly the way our life is molding towards a capitalistic society, uh, the words, the, what are the pillars? How are we, you know, into capitalism? There are three aspects that stand out 
when it comes to capitalism. Um, the word that comes up first is utilitarianism or consumerism, increasingly the wants driving us. Interestingly, a hundred years ago, Sri Aurobindo also used this term utilitarianism, where fundamentally um, the consumerist behavior is what is taking us. The materialist behavior is what is consuming us. Uh, today, around every festival, every national holiday, you have Amazon uh, sale day, Flipkart sale day, a lot of these things happen. Now, what we buy, to what extent is it useful, and to what extent is it really needed is a good question, because eventually, after a year, what we buy with excitement becomes junk, and you know we kind of accumulate it. So this utilitarianism is one pillar. Comparison and keeping up is another pillar of capitalism. The, ad, the, the entire advertising is like that. For example, I remember one television used to advertise saying that uh, owners pride and neighbors envy. Uh, if you closely observe ads that come with paints, uh, again, it is that house with a guy who doesn't use the right paint versus a house with a guy who does use it. Everything is about keeping up and, uh, and comparison. There is a phrase also that's keeping up with the Joneses. You know, Sharma ji se compare karo har cheez. Sharma ji ne gaadi kharidi, hum wahi purani gaadi chala rahe hain. Sharma ji ka beti ne ye kiya, aapne one, all these things, you know, it goes on and on. Um, and, and this consumer, the, 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 there's also every few years, some consumerist behavior takes over. Like there was this toy that you see on this page, which became a major uh, consumer item at one point in time. It's called Tickle Me Elmo. And the thousand rupee toy ended up uh, getting bidded up to tens of thousands of rupees because more and more people wanted it. Everybody else's child had it, so everybody else now wants it. Another important aspect, and this is actually a very sad aspect of uh, the present mode of consumerist slash capitalist approach is a perpetual deficiency complex. We all have seen how whitening creams um, became a mainstay of Indian advertising for decades. It's only now that because it is expected that it is not correct to call it fair and lovely, they now call it glow and lovely, but essentially you put this color of the, 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 the cream and you become fair skinned. Uh, similarly, uh, if you look at uh, a fashion industry or a garment industry, 60% of the jeans that women buy are skinny jeans. That is how they are termed. Whereas the truth is we know less than 20% or body figures are skinny, but that's how they are marketed. There's a, they, they invoke a certain deficiency inside of us and then they target that deficiency. And we go and try to buy. And in fact, Corona today is teaching many of us to turn off from all of these modes of behavior. We'll revisit this at a later time. But there is a more important question. <clears throat> Fine, we are working all life to earn a living. What is wrong with that? Why do we call it slavery? What is wrong? You can spend all your life, you earn a living, you build a good life and you move on. Now here is a question for all of you and you can type your answer in the chat boxes and I will go through them as well. Is if tomorrow somebody comes and gives you a check of your next 30 years of salary, what would you do? What would you want to do from tomorrow if you get your salary given to you? You can write some comments and we can go through uh, some of the details on this and take it from there. I have one person saying he would move to Auroville immediately. What else? What would you do if tomorrow money is no longer the driving force of your life? Any other answers? Beautiful, beautiful. Some of the answers are very touching and beautiful. Someone says we can, uh, Srinath is saying we can give the money to the needy. Someone says, I wish to travel around the world and 
um, develop narratives and understand the local narratives. Um, somebody says, uh, I would like to put it in a fixed deposit. Um, so these are some of the answers that are getting in. And this is a question worth pondering. Take up my passions. Um, absolutely. Um, and many of us seem to be very keen on traveling around the world. Definitely. In fact, mother has gone on to say that uh, <clears throat> traveling expands one's consciousness. Um, someone else says, I'm already doing what I love, so I'll continue doing it. Um, I'm teaching as a freelancer. Um, and that's a very beautiful state to be in. Um, and, uh, you know, Raghav is saying that, uh, you know, I would like to help uh, those who need it more than me. So this is a good question to ponder. And, uh, and I think uh, uh, there is also a nice comment um, from Provost that says, it is not an easy question to answer. And actually, that is very true. That is very true. It is not an easy question to answer. If we put that up in our mind and go to sleep week after week, we may have different layers of answers coming in. I will travel for two years. What do I do after that? There are people, um, for example, I know I have uh, a friend's friend, uh, a couple actually got on a boat and tried to travel around the world, which was a beautiful thing, except after six months, they got thoroughly bored. And then they wanted a house with walls because they just started feeling so um, it's the life just didn't seem to fit in somehow. So we can explore that. And it's a question that we need to keep answering, you know, asking ourselves once in a while and probably finding a vocation um, where our passion, our love, our dream come together and, and, and help us is probably a way to look at it. Now, here is a definition of money. Money is a tool for trading human time. Let us just sink in this aspect. Money is a tool for trading human time. What does it mean? What it means is I spent 20 years developing a certain set of skills. And then because I'm beginning my life and I need money to live my life, I offer my skills and my time to somebody else who says, here, I'll give you some money for it. So that is essentially what money is. It is a mechanism for giving my time to somebody else and my capabilities to somebody else. And that person gives me something in exchange and that is money. Now, here is a very important question. What is my life worth? What is my life worth. If 30 years of my life is what I'm giving to a career, it may not be one company, it may be two companies, it may be 20 companies, it may be two, whatever, it's all details. Money is a tool for trading time. What is my, my time extended over a few years becomes my life. So what am I trading my life for? One of my friends put it very beautifully. He said, at the end of my life, once I leave this body and go up and God says, hey, listen, uh, before you went in, I gave you enough money to last an entire lifetime. What did you do with your life, by the way? How did you spend it? One answer could be, well, you gave me enough money, but you know what? I also had children and I also had grandchildren and I needed to make sure that I earned enough money for all of them. That is one way to spend a life. And many do. These are things we need to ponder over. And the younger we are, when we ponder over these questions, the chances that our life is really more rich is higher. 
asking these questions at 55 or 60 can probably make little marginal difference. But asking these questions less than 30 years of age can change the trajectory of one's life. Let's move on now. This is a historical perspective. I just put it here for uh, reference. Today, when we talk of money, we talk of rupee bills, we talk of dollar bills. The truth is, for centuries, some of these things on your screen were money. Agri breeds were money for 300 years in Africa. Seashells were money in Asia, Africa, Australia, and Americas. Deer leather was money in China and in some parts of America. And then, of course, when you move to metals, we all know gold was money, bronze was money, and so on. Now, if somebody comes and gives you a bunch of seashells today, you will not value it. So what you would value is a, is a, is a few currency notes or a, or, a, or a net banking statement that shows a certain number of zeros. But the question is, how do we make sure that all of it makes sense to us in our life? So what is the framework of money? The framework of money in a very simplistic form is this. We earn, we save, we spend. Actually, we spend first and then we try to save in some cases. In some few wise men, they save first and spend later. And then we try to grow that money and then we try to give that money. Some of you already said that. And here I'm even assuming that even if we receive some money hereditary, that also goes into the same form of usage. But broadly, this is the framework of money. And what we need to figure out is if this is the framework of money, how am I looking at this framework vis-a-vis -vis my life and who I am and the time I spend and what my nature is? How do we relate to money at different levels? We all know Sri Aurobindo talks of physical, vital and mental. And when Sri Aurobindo talks of money, he says predominantly money belongs to the physical and vital spheres. How are we reacting and relating to money in all of these levels? I'll simply give you an example. Um, physical and earning. You know, when I take up a certain work for earning money, does that work that I do physically match with my own attitude towards life and does it give me happiness? Or do I do something physically and when I say physically, I mean, get involved in it physically. And of course, you use your emotions and thoughts. That's a separate issue. But do I pick up a, a, a line of work that does not resonate with my being? As an example, just recently in the last six months, we have heard of many cases of fake call centers where people are calling up uh, clients around the world and threatening them as pretending to be tax collectors of that country saying that I'm calling from the tax department of United Kingdom or Germany or America and you have tax return is not correct. And if you pay $2,000 or 2000 euros, we will adjust it and we will take care. And believe me, crores of rupees have been earned that way. If you're entering into a profession that's fundamentally not right, there is a problem. And then when you are Spending money, when you're giving money, how is your emotion entangled with that movement? One has to examine that closely. Are you restless? Are you nervous? Our vibrations while handling money teach us a lot about who we are and where are the gaps in our personality where we need to grow. When we are doing important business deals, mental restlessness is very common. And the stress is enormous. So much so, um, having been in, in uh, customer oriented work and having been very close to many successful salespeople, I can share with you today that many successful salespeople who are in the very top levels cannot go to bed without alcohol today because the stress that they carry is so tumultuous and so much 
that they need the alcohol to get into the system to be able to get to sleep. If that is what it takes for someone with a spiritual inclination to earn money, then obviously there is some dissonance in that whole framework. These are the things we have to understand and work through. Another framework I will walk you through again. I have not covered it in the previous one in full detail. Many of you understand the frameworks that in which Sri Aurobindo's integral yoga operates. I would urge you, I mean, going back to this slide, to spend time with yourself and go through this layer by layer, what it means. What does it mean at the physical level to spend money? Um, there are people who get very nervous if you're holding a bundle of cash. Uh, there may be right reasons, wrong reasons, doesn't matter. Similarly, other aspects, just work it out with yourself. In fact, chapter four in the book, The Mother, is on the subject of the money and it has very beautiful insights. And uh, another example from the other, other side of the chapter six, Mahalakshmi, um, money has its own vibrations. And at the physical level, beauty and harmony and all of these things, you know, where she presses her feet, goes miraculous streams of an entrancing Ananda. This is how Sri Aurobindo describes Mahalakshmi. If our house is in Pelmel, if our physical structure in the house is not beautiful, uh, not harmonious, then it's unlikely that money will flow. There are rhythms. We will go into more detail of it. Even in South India, for example, um, in every uh, Shravana Mass, Savan Mass, they do Lakshmi Puja on Fridays. And what you do the few days before that is the whole house is cleaned properly. In North, we see this during Diwali, before uh, Diwali Lakshmi Puja, the whole house is cleaned, all the dirt removed. Why? Because there are occult equations where money and beauty and harmony, all of these. So this is a physical aspect. Work through the other aspects and we will, we will take up um, you know, another framework relating to money. Now, out of the five things I've just taken giving money here, and just in that giving money, the attitude we bring to that aspect of giving money can be either tamasic or rajasic, or it can be sattvic. What is tamasic? Tamasic essentially is a dark, dull, slow, lethargic, negative movement. Our temperament, when it has such elements, it is tamasic. For those of you who are not familiar with that term, what is rajasic? Excitement, energy, jealousy, angry, all of that is the rajasic element. When there is an excitement that I'm going to get some money, when there is a depression that I've lost some money, those are all movements in the rajasic environment. And then there is a sattvic element where we try to work out the details in such a way where we are moving towards knowledge, towards peace, towards harmony, towards a settled composure. So when you look at money, there can be, I'll, I'll just put together all of these different things. When we give money in a way where we are grudging, um, we don't want to give, but we are giving it. That is a tamasic movement. I give something, I want something back. That's quid pro quo, that is tamasic. Um, when I give something, I want my name written on the building or the room or, and by the way, when Golconda was being built in our ashram, there were some donors who wanted to give the money to build a room and on the room they wanted a plaque which said given by so and so and um, those after mother's instructions, those donors were politely uh, declined because that is not the spiritual giving. Um, that is not the sattvic giving. Um, but you see this very commonly nowadays. Giving money to gain control or power is again a rajasic movement. So what is the ideal way of giving money? The sattvic way is we give and we forget about it completely. We remember that we are an instrument. God has given us so much. We are in a position to help. The money doesn't belong to me alone. It is God's grace that has put me in a family where there is wealth. It is God's grace that I have come into a situation where I got a good job, where I've been able to earn wealth. I have been very lucky. That is divine grace. That is my guru's blessing. That is my parents' blessing. So I give without thinking that it is me, the egoistic person. Similarly, we have a gratitude for the opportunity to serve people. We all know these movements, but for those of us who are learning, we need to apply this framework of physical, vital, and mental, tamasic, rajasic, and sattvic to all the five elements of giving money. And mastery over money, moving from slave to master movement, that means that we shift towards a 
sattvic behavior we shift towards an enlightened behavior we shift towards a behavior where we become the instrument i am here at this time and the energy of the universe is flowing through me wherever it needs to go it goes nimitta matram bhavasavya sachi that is the statement in bhagavad gita you are just nimitta you are an instrument so we have to bring in the sattvic element in all of these aspects in earning we have to be sattvic also in spending we have to be sattvic also in saving in growing in every aspect we have to move first identify in each of them the rajasic and tamasic elements go through with a fine tooth comb and then move towards enlightened behavior now relating it to the youngsters who are on the line who are building careers how does one create wealth and how does one make money after all that is also an important part i have talked about giving here are some career strategies about making money early career strategies these don't apply if you are over 40 or you know in the middle age of your career that is not what it is so early career corporate strategies can be invest significant invest in your skill enhancement on a repeated basis i used to tell my staff till you are 35 invest 25 to 30% of the money you earn in increasing your own skills whatever skills are relevant whether you are in software development whether you are sales and marketing whether you are in finance whether you have an mba keep developing your skills because every skill in today's world gets outdated within 3 years so whatever you know is gone and today we are very lucky udemy is there academy is there so many online opportunities are there to earn diplomas with a minimal investment quest for excellence is a very very important aspect and a important career strategy to build wealth in a you know in a in your uh, in your work you, you know the simple thing i used to tell my teams were if you are putting your signature on any document saying that this is the proposal this is my technical solution make sure that nobody in the world can say i can do this better excellence has to be at a global level you have to be the best not one of the best that is when the rest of your career will take off like a rocket compromising on excellence finding a bunch of excuses for everything oh i was told at the last minute oh there was not enough time oh uh, somebody was not well in my family oh there is a problem that is for b grade performers a plus performers they skip dinner they skip sleep whatever they need to do they perform at a level of excellence that astounds everyone and then automatically the career shifts into a different gear and as far as salary is concerned grow rapidly switch often negotiate aggressively doesn't matter do what you take to grow your own um you know value in the market earn it very well and don't compromise on it uh don't get into a comfort zone oh my friends are here why should i switch that is not how we look at it in the early part of the career if you wish to grow wealth immediately and rapidly and 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 take your career on an exponential path you need to ensure that you pay attention to this similarly entrepreneurial strategies can also work create a business add value to the world join a startup uh, many startups offer uh, a various stock options and those things and if they work well it will go but of course we all know that entre- entrepreneurially speaking 80 90% of the ventures fail but you know it's okay to take some jackpots you know early in life you can't take risk when you have two children in school parents who are in 70s and uh, you know family that needs your income and an emi for the house you can't take risk at that time you can take risk when you're still young yet to be married or just married without children um or even the children are still in a young age these are the times one can take risk so early career strategy can be about entrepreneurial strategies also you can mix and match that develop passive income strategies diversify income between a couple these are all various ways but the key part is if you wish to come to a point of mastering wealth and having a mastery over this business of earning wealth then earn very well and invest wisely these are the things you need to follow we'll talk a little bit more about the investment part of it and all that prudent planning is a very important part of it the central question one has to ask is how much is enough and the truth of the matter is 
one doesn't really have a right answer because you get very, very wildly different answers. I've had people come to me and say, oh, if I just had one crore in the bank, I'll be done. And I've had somebody who's submitted five crores in the bank, I'm done. And believe me, and I'm not exaggerating this, 15 years ago, one of my friends, 100 crores, I'm done. 15 years ago, those days, you never heard of the hundreds of crores, but how much is enough is a very interesting question that actually few people ask. And even when they ask, what is the irony of human nature is that they keep redefining it every now and then. I'll talk about it more if I have time. So as far as planning is concerned, financial planning is very important. The phrase that I wish that you all remember is failing to plan is planning to fail. In financial terms, failing to plan is planning to fail. Let us make sure we don't do that. We don't plan to fail. We all want to ensure that we are able to work in such a way that we succeed. Educating, educating oneself in, in financial planning is important. Looking at our own personality and understanding whether we are naturally risk averse or naturally pro-risk. You have to understand yourself. If you are conservative and naturally risk averse, uh, putting money in FDs eventually creates a situation where the inflation, inflation makes the value of the money less. On the other hand, if you invest too much in risk, you end up going broke too many times, then you will be working forever. So somewhere that moderation is required. There are ways to do milestone based plannings, income based planning, it is possible. But all said and done, in spite of all the plans, you need grace and abundant grace because somewhere the unexpected will hit each of us. A friend will not turn out to be a friend. And I perhaps don't know anybody in their middle age who hasn't lost money uh, investing in a friend's business or trusting a friend with money. Um, then we have Corona, expect the unexpected. Um, in January, <laughs> like, like all of you have said, I was planning to be in the US by exactly this time. Um, I had already informed my niece who stays there and I, had, uh, I, was, I was planning to book tickets in April. And um, that is the nature of life. Expect the unexpected, but we'll work through it. How do we outwit capitalism? We talked of three pillars of capitalism. One, utilitarian and consumerism was one of the traps into which we fall. Understand that our wants will always exceed our needs. Our wants will always exceed our needs. It's a very important line to remember. Having a budget and working with a budget is important. Some people that I know who work consciously on financial independence, one of the important things they do is first they say what they need to save every month and only then they spend what they need to spend. So that is a very important mantra for financial success. And I told you plastic money is everywhere today. Avoiding credit card debts completely is one of the most important golden rules to avoid utilitarianism and falling into the trap of consumerism. For house and vehicles, yes, it is required to take a debt, but certainly not for vacation, certainly not for buying presents for a girlfriend, certainly not for um, any other of these small things. If you don't have the money, don't do it. Simple. That means you're outliving your framework of financial reference. Comparison and keeping up, define your own success and failure. Others do not and should not define your success. So figure out what your framework is and try to define that and try not to redefine it too many times. Sometimes people say, oh, I'm going to have a bank balance that just runs into one crore and I'm happy or 10 crores and I'm happy. Guess what? When that one crore comes, when that 10 crore comes, immediately we say, no, no, we need another five. We need another 10. And believe me, my friends, 80% of my peer group belongs to that category. In the last 25 years, India has been very lucky in its economic cycle. It was a riding tide and many people of my generation, the boats were all lifted up together. Many of people of, many people of my generation made more money than their parents made 
or probably their forefathers made. In five years, they made more than what their father made in their entire life. But yet, they're not out of the rat race because they kept redefining their boundaries every, every time. To address the deficiency complex, let us understand that it is contentment and not comparison is, that is the key to happiness. It is contentment and not comparison that is the key to happiness. This is very important. Sometimes when I send New Year greetings, I often, not sometimes, I often use the word contentment. May this year give you health, joy, and I also put contentment because it is important that we work and develop a sense of contentment. It won't come and drop down automatically into us. We have to want it. We have to work on it. We have to develop it. We have to pray for it. Otherwise, the perpetual seeking, the vital nature, constantly wanting, wanting, grabbing, it will not stop. And one of the important things we need to also know is that when the purpose and path of life are very clear, when the purpose and path of life are very clear, complexes, comparisons, inferiority, superiority, they all disappear. When we don't have our own purpose and our own path, that is when we fall into this trap of comparisons. And that is when the deficiency complex or the jealousy, Kamakro, the Madhamoha, Matsari, all of these things, they come from there. So we need to understand contentment is important and our own path and purpose are very important. There are a couple of stories that I'll just uh, share with you briefly. So once there was a mendicant who was staying outside of town. And the king asked him to come to the palace and the mendicant refused. He said, my son, I only eat what I get from begging and I cannot come and eat in your palace with all these things. Then the king begged and he said, okay, come for bhiksha, take bhiksha from me, from my hands at my home. And uh, the mendicant went he kept his bowl. The king offered the food that was prepared for him. And the food disappeared. He offered the rest of the food that was there in the kitchen. That too disappeared. Then the king symbolically removed his crown and put it in the bowl. And that too disappeared. The king touched the feet of the mendicant and said, Swamiji, please tell me what is this bowl made of? And the Swamiji said, my son, this bowl has been made of human greed. This bowl has been made of human greed. Such is our temperament if we let it go. Such is our temperament if we don't withhold ourselves. So this is one story I wanted to share with you. The second story was about a fisherman. One day a fisherman was sleeping peacefully under the shade of a tree around 11 o'clock in the morning. One of his relatives who had come from the city came and woke him up. And he said, why are you so lazy? He said, what do you mean I'm lazy? I got up in the morning. By five o'clock, I was in my boat. By seven o'clock, I caught the fish and came back. I went to the market and everything was sold by 10 and I've done my day's work and I'm resting. He said, what do you mean resting? Nobody rests at the peak of the day. You have another eight hours before sunset. You got to work all day. You're a healthy man. Go fishing again. Get some more fish. And you can sell again in the evening market. This man was a little surprised. He didn't understand the ways of the city folk. He said, why? Well, then you can make twice the money that you make right now. So what? Oh, then you can build a bigger house. So, well... You can be more happy. This man says, well, I was quite happy before you woke me up. I am where I am and I'm content with what I have. I don't need to go 
fishing in the ocean 10 times or five times the way you think. I'm happy with what I have. And this is the nature of life. We just need to figure out how do we work our nature? A little bit of a spiritual perspective of money. Sri Aurobindo talks about money. He calls it a universal force. Money is a universal force. It is there for all of us in abundance, as much as we want. There is no limitation to it. It has its own rhythms. It has its tide, it has its ebb. It comes and goes. That is the nature of money. Fickleness, chenchalta, kehte hain We need to respect that. We need to understand that. Money carries vibrations. I will talk more about this subject in the next week's talk, but I'll briefly introduce these things. Sri Aurobindo says uh, in chapter four of the mother, of the book, The Mother, it carries vibrations, asuric, in some temperament. Why? Because of its long seizure by the asura, he says. What does it mean? Sri Aurobindo's definition, when he says asuric, we all think, we think of Ravana, 10 heads, a crown, and that big guy, that is Asura. Sri Aurobindo defines Asuric temperament very differently. He says, when there is an egoistic temperament, egocentric temperament with the desire to possess and enjoy purely in a selfish and personal way, that is Asuric. Let us apply this definition to ourselves first and see whether we are contributing those vibrations to money. It is a very important part and we'll take it up again. There are karmic linkages to money. There are occult laws. In fact, in the, the section on Mahalakshmi, there are so many things that Sri Aurobindo describes where there is harmony, where there is beauty and where Mahalakshmi walks away from selfishness, greed, jealousy, envy, all of these things when they are there. The devil's poisonous stuff, he calls it. So when our nature is not purified, our capacity to hold money declines. Purification of our vital nature is an important part of our capacity and mastery of wealth. Mother says somewhere that in one of her occult visions, it was revealed to her. Uh, there was a snake guarding a wealth, uh, guarding wealth. And when mother was there and uh, uh, the discussion happened about the wealth coming to the ashram and all of that, the message that she received at that time was unless there is a complete control over the sexual impulse, wealth would not flow. These are all occult laws that most of us do not understand yet. And those of us who are trying to chisel our life in some of these ways, we need to understand many of these occult laws. And also money is just one aspect of wealth. So we need to keep that also in mind. So I think that brings me to the end of the presentation per se. We will try to now spend a little bit of time on questions and answers. But before doing that, I'll just put up uh, the next week's detail, we will be talking about spiritual secrets of money next week. So this is where I will stop my PowerPoint sharing. Um, this is our topic for the next week, and I do hope we get to continue it together. And we can move over. I will hand the microphone back to Harshita. Or Rahul, who is, Rahul is taking it over. Rahul is taking the question. Okay, Rahul. Um, before we move to the question and answers, I'll request Raghav to post the feedback link in the chat window. Raghav, can you do that? Yes, that is something of importance to us. Uh, as we do these sessions week after week, your feedback helps us in. Uh, both understanding how the present sessions are going and also we request input from all of you for other topics um, going forward so you can fill up the feedback form also.
So we'll take a minute uh, to fill the feedback. Okay, moving on to questions, perhaps I can start with uh, a question from myself <laughs> that I have. Um, so with someone who's uh, just about to start into his 30s uh, working in the corporate sector. Um, so what would you recommend? Uh, how can I plan uh, my finances? So I'm someone who's spiritually inclined uh, given that, uh, what would you advise? So, each each individual's um, circumstance and position um, is unique in that aspect. Uh, the life goals, setting out life goals would be a great place to start. What is your view of life over the next 10 years um, as you see it? Uh, what would be your milestones? And based on that, one can look at how to plan the financial aspect. Another important aspect is um, self-assessment of one's own um, uh, behavior uh, when it comes to finance and wealth management and these aspects becomes important. Understanding whether I'm um, risk prone, risk averse, too conservative, moderately uh, risk, uh, uh, you know, moderately open to risk. Uh, so, two, so two, three things. One, understanding what is the roadmap for the next 10, 15 years? What is the view? Um, second, um, what is my own perspective of my nature and how am I responding and reacting? These two will then allow you to define a certain boundary and say that, okay, this is what I need and and whatever I have can help me get there by doing X, Y, and Z. Um, it could be investing in a certain way. Um, it could be um, focusing on first, um, probably aggressively moving on the career front, um, or uh, it could be um, like I was talking about earlier, if the temperament permits, if there is an entrepreneurial opportunity at the background, someone else is starting it, you're interested in it, and there is a trust element involved, there's a passive income opportunity. So this is how one can explore this. Okay, so I have a question from Darshan um, on Facebook. How was your experience and relationship with money throughout your career? Uh, mine was, a, was an interesting uh, approach. Um, somehow I strangely got it into my head that uh, at 25, I got it into my head that I wanted to retire by 35. Um, and uh, that gave me a certain vision, but I was too raw to have a plan. And I was not in a set of circumstances where I knew anyone whom I could approach to help with the plan. But what I did was um, focus on two aspects. One was um, uh, my skill set was uh, one of the best. And it also um, allowed me to work with some of the best companies. And where I felt that I was not adequately compensated um, I took very aggressive and risky maneuvers. Um, I left a very well-known company when the company was just becoming very big in India, purely because I felt that I wasn't uh, being, uh, the, the, the compensation I was getting was not fair for, you know, was not fair. And it was also proved correct because I called other companies and I directly set up meetings with their senior people. And I, within one leap, I quadrupled my salary. Um, four times, I mean, which is kind of an unnatural thing. 
but uh, I was also very well known in my industry at that point in time. And uh, even when they went around asking clients for references, my name was on the top of the list. So the company was willing to pay me. So this was one aspect. I focused on increasing my earning potential. But the second aspect was even more interesting was I upskilled myself rapidly on the knowledge of finance and wealth management. I literally bought around 15 to 20 books. Those days, YouTube videos weren't very common. Access to such sophisticated uh, uh, knowledge base wasn't very easy. But as I used to travel, and particularly as I traveled to other countries, uh, uh, Silicon Valley, Bay Area, etc., I picked up the latest books that were there on wealth management. Um, I still remember one book I picked up, this title that I just put up, How Much Is Enough, is actually a book I picked up from an Australian author on financial management at that time. That gave me the necessary insights of what works. So one, I maximized my income streams. Uh, I didn't go for second income or entrepreneurial because I just couldn't, uh, what I was handling was low, was a big enough load that I didn't have any spare time. But I learned the skills and uh, I tried working with some of the best banks and I realized it was actually a, a, a useless exercise. Uh, but it took me 10 years to realize that. But all of these things put together helped me plan my investments. I, I kind of say that it wasn't the specifics of what I did as much as the thought process that I brought to the process that helped me engineer myself towards uh, financial freedom. And uh, I couldn't retire at 35, but I left my job at 44. And uh, even there, there was a very important lesson um, that I wish to share. Because when I resigned, and uh, of course, people resign, it's a part of the game. My team members, some of them who knew me personally, they came and asked me. Because when somebody wants to you know, basically pick his job, they say, I don't like that term. But when somebody wants to leave it, essentially what is the peak of your career, because you are now on a trajectory where the hard work is done. Once you've reached a certain level thereafter, you know, director, vice president, moving in those directions, while the stress is not lesser than it, the grunt work that we did in the beginning part of the career in, in 20 to 28 range, that is not the same. So why would somebody leave when the pay packet is so good? I just said one thing. Um, it is not that I think I have enough money, but I had to figure out, am I going to run out of money in my life or am I going to run out of my life before I do something really meaningful that I've been wanting to do with? That clarity helped me leave my job. Um, there was a question that has come up. Insecurity sometimes makes us run behind money. And that is the answer. The, what I just shared with you is the answer. Um, it, I didn't know whether I had enough money or not. And every spreadsheet that I put in, it talks of inflation of 6%, 7%, or a loaf of bread is going to cost 200 rupees in 10 years. What are you going to do? A packet of milk will cost you 200 rupees. How are you going to live? Those will always be there. Uh, but somewhere, um, and I can tell you this after having done very rigorous financial analysis, uh, the most sophisticated packages, nobody can give you 100% certainty. I'll give you a simple example. Uh, when I ran some financial package, I'll, I'll, I'll just share some um, uh, example numbers. Let us say I want to retire for the rest of my life with this, this set of uh, requ financial requirement of 50,000 to run my house, etc. How much money do I need? Let us say the software says, if you have one crore, there's a 70% chance that you will be able to live comfortably with what your requirement is. But I say 70% is not enough. I would like to have 90% certainty. Okay, if you want to have 90% certainty, then you will need 15 crores. If you want 95% certainty, you want 50 crores. This is what the financial models will tell you. There is no guarantee. There is no 100% guarantee anywhere. There's no security. You have to make a leap of faith using your common sense, using your capacity. And we all are blessed in one respect. We are children of Mahalakshmi. So I transferred the burden to her. I said, listen, I have waited long enough. 35 to 44 is almost a decade. This was not my plan, but now I am giving up. You take care. 
and that kind of works out after that some things work out some things don't but you are in the protected umbrella of the divine and finally the path we are choosing to walk is the path of sadhana and moving increasingly towards the divine so the divine will do his bit if we are willing to take our leap of faith rahul yes with that i'll go to the next question um it's from selesh on facebook attraction towards money is decreasing day by day what should we do attraction towards money is decreasing day by day yes uh, what was the name of the person selesh selesh well um selesh ji badhai ho because you are blessed to be one of the few souls where the pull towards the divine is increasing day by day um your sadhana is yielding results that is why the spontaneous detachment is taking hold of you this is the spiritual development having said that many of us are not sanyasis we are grihasthas wife two children parents dependent on us are all a part of the journey and in that context nimitta matram bhava savya sachi we are instruments we have chosen a path so we continue on the path and not only do we continue on the path we continue gloriously on the path the more the detachment the more the samyam the more the consciousness of instrumentality the more we are likely to become perfect instruments of the divine in fact i'll just read out a passage to um on on this aspect from chapter 4 Sri Aurobindo says if you are free from the money taint money taint means that pull towards money that desire towards money that vital attachment to the money if you are free from the money taint but without any ascetic withdrawal you will have a greater power to command the money for the divine work equality of mind absence of demand and the full dedication of all you possess and receive and all your power of acquisition to the divine shakti and her work are the signs of this freedom so selesh ji please aspire that this inner freedom comes and manifests fully in you and you become a very powerful instrument of the mother i know some of you who are participating today have been um in the sessions we conducted uh, in train the trainer camps of oro youth and uh, i said something a few years ago there and i'll repeat it here not with any kind of arrogance or ego but honestly with a sense of asking for the mother one of those sessions maybe i got carried away i said if somebody gives me a check today of 10 crores for mother's work i will happily receive it and within a year i'll come back asking for more and i really hope some of you who are here today with us develop that capacity have that capacity of immense wealth because we belong to a tradition of sri aurobindo where wealth is not looked upon as the root of all evil where uh, wealth is not looked upon as a weakness in fact some siddhas that are alive in india today regard shri arbindo as the first pioneer in sanatan dharma uh, parampara who broke one of the barriers towards wealth by proclaiming wealth for the divine he says the divine the wealth has to be won back for the divine and one of the siddhas i heard him he said shri arbindo broke the barrier at the occult plane and he was the first person to do so and today because of his efforts many spiritual lineages can receive wealth more easily when they are sincere in their work and ask for money there is always a flow so we should all aspire to be instruments of the 
mother and instruments of the divine flow of money and then channelize it in a way that can help our work moving on to the next question uh, it's from anshula she's asking um, could you throw some light on how we should handle money at the different stages age of our life and how can money money's vibration and our journey of spirituality be balanced well this is uh, um two three questions uh, brought together but i will try to answer each of them uh, how should we treat money at different stages of life today on the call for example we have one youngster whose first salary was offered to the mother the first salary that she received was offered to the mother this is our approach towards money and wealth whatever i receive is yours and tera tujhko arpan a little bit of it we'll try to use it for our work and then a little bit of it we offer it to you this is a beautiful attitude at every stage another aspect is and this is an approach that can apply across all stages of life tera tujhko arpan is a very beautiful phrase but it is often um combined with the worldly wisdom while offering wealth to the divine i receive immense amount and i offer a little bit to the divine for a person who receives a hike of 5 uh, lakhs i offer 500 rupees to the divine this disparity somewhere has always uh, amused me because i've seen it in so many places contrast it with some traditions where 10% of the wealth of the money is always offered to the divine whatever the backs the books are balanced at the end of the year 10% goes to the divine figure out in your life wherever you are what percentage of that year's income or wealth growth or whatever you are willing to offer to the divine start with whatever you are comfortable with half a percent point 1 percent 1 percent 2 percent whatever figure out some number but stick to that percentage honestly and sincerely for the rest of your life and increase it if you have the means and capacity to do so so this attitude and approach towards wealth does two things first thing is when we receive money and when i say when we i mean when an average person receives money the forces that are governing his income are normally genetic karmic astrological and a few other things thrown together this is what directs the money flow once we consciously open a channel towards the divine and are very rigorous and meticulous about that then the divine light starts influencing all the five aspects of wealth i talked about earning spending this that everything gets into the divine purview and that light purifies the wealth that is coming and there is a no bigger grace than that i am not saying the wealth will increase mind you i am not saying the money will increase it purifies it it purifies the vibrations that are coming in and in that process a new energy will start taking over rather than the karmic astrological genetic family karma that is otherwise defining it so this is broadly how you change the vibration of the wealth and as far as the different stages are concerned we are when you are in the grihastha stage don't be guilty keep in mind the final word of spiritual life in shirobindo's path is also bhukti bhukti he says our yoga is the method of vedanta with the aim of tantra detachment inside detachment is the method of vedanta but detachment inside and bhukti is the essence of tantra enjoy life fully in fact i will tena tyaktena bhunjita magrida kashi siddhana enjoy everything with detachment that is what ishavasya upanishad says in the very first shloka and of course they also had the second part which is don't let jealousy and comparisons come into play we'll leave that out so this is how we can take this detachment earning the money and offering it to the divine and changing its vibration
going ahead. Um, so the next question is from Pooja Ji. Um, how to differentiate between greed for money and balanced financial progress? And we have uh, four more questions after this. Okay, so I will keep the answers a little bit to the point, and we'll try to maybe take a you know till we'll continue till maybe nine twenty or so and try to wrap up. The key part is observe the vibrations that are there and work on overcoming the vibration. When greed comes, observe that vibration of greed. When fear and insecurity come, observe that vibration of fear and insecurity. Remember and offer those vibrations to the mother. And please, Pooja, do not think that these are only aspects to you. All of these aspects are with every one of us. Each and every one of us has all of these vibrations. In greed is a natural part of every one of us at some point or the other. One may respond at one level, another may respond at a different level. One may respond in one situation, another. But the truth is we have to observe those vibrations, bring them into the light of our consciousness, pray to the mother to dissolve those, pray to our guru to dissolve those, and then gradually move forward. And aspire for good financial position, nothing wrong with it. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. Aspire for financial progress, but with a certain element of detachment and ask mother to provide us with the detachment. And as one of our participants earlier said, my detachment is growing. That is because of his aspiration. That is because of his intensity of seeking. Over gradually, it will get dissolved. Let us continue, Rahul. The next question is from Soumya on Facebook. How do we plan for our health expenses? Health expenses is a very tricky business. And uh, there are a couple of important statistics I would like to share. While we do financial planning, most people tell us that inflation is around 5%, 6%, 7%, 8%. But medical inflation, you will be surprised to know, is 15% plus. In other words, if an operation costs 1 lakh today, next year, it will not cost 1 lakh 5,000 according to normal inflation. It is likely to cost 1 lakh 15,000. These are things that we have to balance out. Insurance is a part of that whole process, but medical expenses are a little bit on the tricky side. It is very difficult to plan for them, but one can take as many precautions as possible, both in terms of insurance, um, and in terms of planning a higher amount based on the higher growth uh, that is there on it. Many senior citizens also face these issues because if you know the situation today, the FD rates have gone down to 5% and inflation of medical expenses is going up more and more. And many senior citizens are caught today between this dichotomy. Moving on to the next question. Uh, can there be a combination of detachment for money one has, but also a kind of insecurity for the money which one does not have? Isn't this contradictory? This question is from Dr. Utpala Karud. Karodji, one thing that is common to all of us as humans is inner contradictions and double standards. We just need to look at the right place and all of us carry these contradictions and double standards. What is wonderful is that a small seed has already germinated. The green shoots of detachment are already visible. The insecurity is what we have all brought in these past life after life after life because that is how we have lived. It is there, it is a part of my DNA, it is a part of your DNA. But the green shoot of detachment needs to be watered more and more, sadhana more and more, offered to the divine more and more. Whenever insecurity comes, one of the, in fact, there is a somewhere I've seen mother's handwritten note, no fear. For us, we are children of Mahalakshmi. For us, the universe is open. I showed that force that it's just like rain it is pouring in. And 
our ultimate destiny when we hand over to the divine he protects us takes care of us we jump we are the greatest bungee jumpers in the world because we know those palms never fail us but let us continue to work on sadhana let us continue to work on the watering that developing detachment but it has to be done consciously it has to be repeatedly done again and again but there will be progress for sure so moving on to the last question by madhavi from facebook is it wrong to desire money which i wish to use it wisely on me and also on certain community service goals that i have but is the desire by itself is it asuric the word uh, asuric where if it refers to the previous context where we spoke about um shri arbindo refers to asuric aspect of the vibration as being associated with our desire with our egoistic needs with our self centered you know approach grandiose showing off material acquisition possession i me and myself that is the asuric vibration to ask for money even for running our family in a very comfortable way is not asuric because that is the path we are chosen we, we are we are grihasthas asking for money was wrong in older spiritual traditions in fact suffering was said to be the way to redeem ourselves of sin and money was considered to be something to be no that is not the path of today spirituality and that is certainly not the path of mother and shri arbindo and integral yoga we do not despise money nor do we carry a guilt trip we accept we invite we grow we blossom we bloom all of us can wholeheartedly invite mahalakshmi into our hearts let her bloom inside and let her manifest her grace outside as material wealth and the more the merrier the more the the vaster the grace the more abundance the more opulence the more joyful absolutely nothing wrong in our path to want more to ask for more but yes no feverish seeking after money or wealth no feverish seeking after money or wealth no vital pursuit no egoistic demand those we will keep aside and the rest we will enjoy mother's bounty with that beautiful thought we are at the end of our interaction today um thank you everyone for staying with us till the end and we hope to see you in the next um, interesting session on the coming sunday based on the same theme money till then um stay blessed thank you thanks for being with thank us thank you everyone